Good afternoon, Emily. Good how are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thank you for joining us for Chamber Chat today. Absolutely. We're Absolutely. Happy to Thank you. Thank you. I will preface this by saying I'm working from home, like a lot of other people, and that includes, involves dogs and teenagers. So hopefully okay. they, all, they all keep quiet. It'll be, it'll be just fine. We're all, you know, <laughs> making the same boat. Have. Yeah, absolutely. So Chamber family, we're happy to welcome Miss Emily Durham today to Chamber Chat. Uh, we're going to talk about some leasing issues. Um, as as many of us have and so i'll give you a little bit of background about emily and then we'll jump right into it so emily durham is partner and director of hospitality services for waterman steel real estate advisors she has spent 30 years in the restaurant industry doing back house operations strategic consulting with her own business restaurant connections which was founded in 2009 and she joined with Waterman Steel to become their director of hospitality services. Uh, Emily holds a bachelor's degree in hotel and restaurant management from New York Institute of Technology and an MBA with honors from Rice. So we're talking to a very smart woman. <laughs> she also holds a real estate license in Texas and is a member of ICSC. So please let us welcome Emily Durham today to Chamber Chat. So thank you, Emily, for joining us. Thank so, you so much. We've had uh, some really scared and afraid members um, that are looking to see what they can do to help their situation with regard to leasing. And so um, uh, we'll get into these questions and uh, see how we can help our members. So. Absolutely. First question is, um, give us an idea of the significance of the commercial real estate market in Houston. Is it a big contributor to our economy? Well, I, um, first I just, I guess I wanna say that our firm, Waterman Steel Real Estate Advisors, represents people from every sector of the real estate industry. I do a lot of retail and restaurants, but we're looking at office situations and industrial and everything else. Um, that, that question has a couple answers. So on the one hand, commercial real estate is the second largest asset class in the entire country. But if you think about it, a big part of what's driving commercial real estate in Houston are the businesses that are occupying the commercial real estate. And in Houston, the number of energy, work peop, energy employees um, is larger than most other markets in the country. And that accounts for a lot of our office space. Our restaurant industry, which is something I pay very close attention to, has millions of restaurant employees and more restaurants per capita than anywhere. So in that regard, it is. Yes. So um, when we're talking about, you know, the, the, commercial re the commercial real estate industry, we're talking about a lot of restaurants. Um, and I know that that industry is being greatly impacted you know, by the COVID-19 virus. Um, so let's say a restaurant or owner, someone who's, on, who's in a retail space or even in an office building, um, if they find themselves unable to pay rent, uh, what options do you think they have? Well, so that is exactly what's happening with everybody right now. And we are, my firm is trying to help all our clients as much as possible. But, you know, to a large extent right now, these are conversations. There's not necessarily a legal mechanism in your lease or in your insurance policy. And I know we're going to talk more about that. Mm -hmm. But right now we're sort of, um, you know, in, we're always in partnership with our landlords. And now more than ever... Sorry about my little dog, Dexter. Um, You're not paying attention. <laughs> now more than ever, um, we're, we're having to have conversations about, so two different things. One is we're talking to landlords and just asking for help. Straight up, having a conversation. We want this to work out between us. What can you do for us? And so we're hearing different things in that regard. Um, and I would, I would preface all that to say this is no time to be adversarial. We need to have friendly conversations, mutually supportive conversations with our with our landlords. 
and you know not approach this from the standpoint of you have to do something for me because quite honestly they don't at this point um so what we're here we're hearing different things we have one large houston landlord that has said i will waive your rent for the next two months but you have to pay it back over 2021 with no interest but we'll have you pay it back over a year's time a year from now Another landlord may say, I will give you April for, you know, no worry about the rent and we'll worry about it later. Um, another has said, we can give you a couple months abatement on base rent, but not the triple net, you know, where we pay the landlords for taxes and insurance, because mm -hmm. that's just a pass through expense of their obligation. Right. And then, uh, of course, there are others, just like everybody else, that are still trying to figure it out and they're kind of, just like the people operating the businesses trying to figure out how to handle this when the landlords have obligations just like the, the, the businesses do, really. Right, right. So it really is just based on, you know, a, a particular landlord situation and, and the, the renter's situation. Um, and so I see why it's more of a conversation. You know, you, you, you get what you can get. It's going to be a give and take situation. Um, and it's just really talking, just talking it out. And maybe, yeah. you know, the paying it back over the next year, maybe they're adding a little bit of what you owed in 2020 on to you know, a monthly um, rent next year. Or, right, right. So we, a couple, you can, we can look at, at um, paying it off over time. We can, the best case scenario is we just get a rent reprieve for a couple months. Right. Um, we can suggest that we tack on the amount of rent abated to the very end of the lease. We'll extend the length of our lease. Just give me a few months to, to live through this. And there's sort of lots of different scenarios. Um, and it really, it does depend on the landlord. And it's so fluid also because when this first started happening, I think there were a lot of landlords that said, hey, I have bills to pay just like you do. But as things continue, we don't know how long it's gonna go on and we really see the detrimental impact it's having to everybody. They're changing, they're changing their tune a little naturally to help support their, their tenants. Right, because at the end of the day, it is a relationship. I mean, Absolutely. you don't want to upset your tenants because you know after this is over with, the market might look totally different and it might be a renter's market. So. Yeah, and I mean, landlords that are that are in it to to get through it together with their tenants, especially for restaurants, have we're seeing things like they're setting up um, curbside pickup areas in their shopping centers. You know, kind of doing everything they can to help promote um, the only way restaurants, for sure, can stay open right now, which is delivery and takeout. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's good to know that there are landlords out there that are really trying to work with their tenants. Absolutely. Because it is a relationship. And I think everybody in general wants to see the other person come out good after all of this. So, yeah, yeah the, the concern is just that by the legal letter of your lease document, if you don't pay rent, you're in default. Yeah. Being in default of a contract is just not, that's what we want to avoid. Right. However, I think we're also going to start to see different interpretations of that legal language um with respect to the term force majeure yeah uh, which means something is beyond your control and makes it impossible for you to do what you need to be doing right and, uh, there's there's been discussions about the fact that it's impossible to do business if you're a retail tenant and you had to close right now you can't possibly do business as the permitted use that was that was prescribed in your lease. So I think that all of that's going to start to evolve too. And it's a good time to stay close to your advisors, legal advisors and, you know, accounting advisors and attorneys and real estate brokers and everybody. Right. To get that assistance. I mean, that's what we're all here for, you know, our, yeah. our professional team. And it's, a, I think it's probably a part of an overall package of, you know, business help. You know, you want to lean on your advisors at this time. So um, please pay attention, Chamber Nation. 
you want to lean on your advisors at this time. And especially your bankers. I We should say, like, what can you do right now? Other than just having the conversation, let's be good to each other and help each other through it, is the fact that there's a $2 trillion stimulus package, relief package out there. And if you don't, if you have any question about what to do, you need to go to your local banker. Um, I can send you, Carol, a link to a couple of banks that people can sign up for. But it is the time to start applying for the Paycheck Relief Act and various other things. And there's a lot of small print in there that says things like, if you qualify and you do not lay off employees and keep those employees, you'll get credit back against this. And that by itself will help you reduce a, maybe a couple of months of your of your overhead costs. So anybody, everybody should be filling out these these applications. And it sounds like everybody's really working hard and fast to fast track that the access to funds. Yeah, absolutely. They, everyone's working really hard to try to make that happen. So g great points. We need to make sure that we take advantage of the stim stimulus package. Mm -hmm. so, um, what do you think about business insurance applying to this type of situation? So kind of much like the lease, it really depends on what your specific insurance policy says. And unfortunately, a lot of this is going to come up in the business income section of insurance policies. And believe it or not, a lot of those specifically will say that that insurance won't cover contagious disease. So in some cases, it is, it's already written out of your insurance. The insurance companies will tell you that for an insurance carrier to try and cover the risk of an epidemic or a pandemic would put everybody out of business because you can't, how can you underwrite that? You don't have any idea what it means. So I think the, the first natural thought most people would have, including me, is doesn't this count for business interruption? And not necessarily. However, you need to talk to your insurance brokers. I've had clients tell me that um, if somebody tested positive, a customer came in that was positive or employees were tested positive and exposed everybody such that you have to close to remediate that, then that could be considered business interruption. So again, it's kind of time to pull out all stops and read the fine print and more than anything, call your, call your insurance people and who knows you know, who knows how that's going to evolve over time. Now we're starting to see class action lawsuits. And we saw there was one in Chicago today on behalf of business owners to try and get insurance money. So I think all sorts of different things are going to happen that haven't happened yet. Right, right. It seems to me that it would behoove insurance companies to just get ahead of that uh, and go ahead and make some concessions. You know, in business, you don't necessarily want to just give away the farm but you can go ahead and make some concessions because they're cheaper than fighting a class action lawsuit. Right. And I think every right now, everybody's just really trying to figure it out. And since everything is so new and evolving and we thought, okay, this could last a week. And now, now we're at another month and maybe in some States are saying they're going to be at home till June. I think that people are really trying to get their, their arms around the situation and, and we have to kind of maybe even get past some of the initial knee-jerk reactions to this and let people stop and make smart decisions about, you know, what's best for our economy. Right, because you do have to recalibrate. You have to say to yourself, oh, wait a minute, this is an epidemic. It's not someone just trying to get something for nothing or get out of the terms of their insurance right. agreement. There really is something going on, so it can't be business as usual. Right. Know? So what do you think about subletting? Would that work in a situation like this? A million percent. The, you know, at the end of the day, we're still obligated to the terms of our contracts. And a lease is a contract. It may, you know, a lot of leases say that you can, maybe, maybe your lease says you cannot sublease or you could not assign your lease. My guess is that the landlords are going to be a little bit more amenable right now. Um, they might still hold you personally responsible for, you, you know, a lot of people have personal guarantees on their lease, but given that technically we're still abiding by these contracts, these leases, then absolutely. If you can find somebody to, I think it's gonna be hard to find somebody to walk into your lease paying full rent tomorrow, but anything like that that can happen now, you know, and of course we're getting phone calls from people who, see opportunity here and say, I know there's going to be a lot of second generation spaces coming up. 
unfortunately, you know, keep us in mind. So, mm -hmm. especially for the office market, subleasing has been um, pretty prevalent for a while now, just because the the energy markets really started to hurt the office market even before the coronavirus did. So they just got a huge double whammy, yeah. and and the subleasing market for that has been big. Okay, so subleasing is definitely an option, even if it covers part of the rent, because you never know, your landlord may take that. I mean, some money is better than no money. Exactly, and you may take that. You, as the, as the lease holder, you may give somebody a lower lease rate and you pay the rest of it. Like just anything to alleviate part of your obligation is probably a good thing. It's, it's ultimately, as of right now, it's still your responsibility not necessarily the landlords. Will the landlords help? Definitely. But it, at the end of the day, legally, it's still your responsibility, but you should be well within your rights to look for um, tenants. Right, right, absolutely. And, you know, there are a lot of trends, um, and I guess it's not so much a trend anymore. Um, more people are uh, doing co-working spaces. Uh, would you say that the same rules as far as landlord tenant and being responsible for your space apply here? Um, I honestly, I do not know the answer to that. My guess would be that they do not, because in that case, you have one landlord that has common areas and there's no way those common areas can be open right now. So my guess is that they also don't know how to answer the question. They're a little bit shell shocked right now, but I would think in that case, the onus is more on the landlord. They created a like a common area workspace for people's convenience that is just not going to be convenient right now. So no. Right. So in co-working space environments, then it, it sounds like the tenant may have more of an upper hand because we can't be close to each other. Well, and again, it, uh, you know, with when things get to legal discussions, it depends what your lease says, and it may not say anything about that. But then we're going to have a lot of discussions to try and, you know, interpret whatever we do have. But yeah, that the whole point of that was so everybody could be in a communal environment, and that is definitely not going to happen right no, now. Not right now, unfortunately. Uh, those co-working spaces get the creative juices flowing, but, you know, we had to take it online now. And whoever would have thought that, that this could happen with all these, all these innovations and, and new ideas and brilliant ways for people to work together in a million years, nobody would have, obviously nobody would have seen this coming. It's just crazy. Yeah, yeah it really takes you, it, it, it kind of throws your mind for a loop, especially mm -hmm. um, for those people who, would draw their creativity and energy from being in those spaces. I can only imagine what they're going through at this point. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and so we've been talking about the tenant, um, but let's uh, switch to the landlord for a little bit. Um, what types of issues should landlords be aware of in this environment to just kind of cover themselves? Well, the landlords, as we talked about, you know, they have mortgages to pay just like we all do. So they're looking for the same information about what opportunities they have for, for relief and assistance. You know, sometimes you hear talk about um, forgiving mortgage payments for a little while, whether that's going to be residential and commercial or both or neither. So um, they're in a tough place because they have obligations as well. And and there it's even harder for them because they they know it's going to be it would be hard to replace a tenant right now so they're not going to kick people out right but they have rent to pay also and so it's a really really tough spot for them to be in yeah yeah i um you know there's been talk i was on a call a couple of calls about what the uh, office market is going to look like after covid-19 and um it, it, it just kind of looks like not so good. Like it, it, it's, it's not looking that great. Um, and so when people are able to go back to work, what do you think the office market is going to look like, the occupancy rate? Do you think there's going to be a significant decline or, you know, so far, what are your thoughts? I know we're kind of still a little bit early, but what do you think? We are, but, and, and, 
it, it, according to what a lot of industry experts are, are you know, talking about now is the problem with the office space for Houston is that it already took a big hit because of the energy sector. Mm -hmm. So it already declined. Occupancy rates are already down. So to that extent, then they're going to be down even more than they already were. It's probably going to be the hardest hit sector through all of this. And again, thinking about the inhabitants or the you know people leasing this commercial property, if your business is not essential and it's not something that can thrive right now, which some are, then of course it's gonna we're gonna have a lot of vacancy. Mm -hmm. And so, if vacancy could mean insolvency, not necessarily just a great renters market, it could really be a problem for for landowners and and the economy. But the office office sector, I think, already got a huge huge hit and it was already down from energy. Okay. Um, and, you know, we've been in a recession before with the oil bust in the 80s. You know, um, I think there are some lessons that can be taken from that, you know, as far as, you know, landlords moving forward. Would you happen to have any thoughts about, you know, what was done during that time? What was done during the, the um, the fracking bust that we had in 2008, 2009, some of the lessons that landlords may have learned from that time that could be applied now? Well, the um, I have a few partners that were very active in Houston commercial real estate during that time with uh, banking and found themselves with um, an incredible number of assets that needed, needed a new tenant. Um, the first thought is that there's, um, it's just, it's just kind of like when Blockbuster went out of business because we don't need it anymore. Yeah. I think it became a situation where we had to repurpose buildings and find secondhand tenants. So the sooner people start thinking about things like that, probably um, the better. Mm -hmm. And that might be employing the right resources to help you do that. But um, back then people had to, it was, it was, an awful situation. People had to really work fast to try and come up with replacements mm -hmm. and repurposing ideas. Yeah. And it's like now, you know, some of these buildings could be repurposed as healthcare facilities. You know, um, I mean, people are using public parks. Why not some buildings that are vacant? Honestly, as a human being and not as a commercial real estate professional, I think the same thing. It seems like there's a good opportunity with all these large vacant uh, big boxes. Maybe, you know, certainly New York is doing what they can in every possible square inch. Um, seems like that's logical if we need it. Yeah, yeah, if we need it. Hopefully we don't, but if we do, um, that seems like if I were a, a landlord with, with a big box store, that might be something that I look into doing. Another thing that we've seen in Houston in general, even before this, is, is kind of taking a look at converting former commercial space to residential. So at the end of the day, Houston still had the second or third largest population increase in the entire country for 2019. So as that continues to happen, and there's probably no reason to think we're, we're going to drop too, too far below that, um, you know, we saw people taking apartment buildings and convert, or I'm sorry, uh, the first example that comes to mind is an old shopping center that they converted to apartments and things like that. And so maybe we have opportunities there as well because our population is absolutely expanding rapidly and, and that might be, changing the use might be something to, to really look at. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and are you aware, you know, we have this big stimulus package, you know, the government on every level is trying to help, um, help us all in business and personally, do you know if there are any government protections that have been initiated for landlords? Well, I think that it's the same, the same kind of relief packages are available at the landlord level and the employer level the same way that they are at the at the lc level now like we talked about will will legislation come out that says that there's going to be mortgage payment forgiveness for a little while or we can skip a few months maybe 
But specifically for the landlords, I think they're needing to avail themselves in exactly the same way. There's, they just have more employees than um, the machine shop does, and they have more more of everything to to deal with. But that package is for everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So landlords take advantage just like any other business owner just make sure absolutely you get in as quickly as you can um as far as the uh the loans and grants that are going on um do you think that there will be any delay in the construction projects that are going on due to COVID-19 that is very near and dear to our hearts as we have people signing new leases and building out new restaurants and new spaces and you know, that's kind of the million dollar question, but what it sounds like in Houston right now is that while the permitting office has moved to a work from home model, it is not closed and uh, construction is still considered essential business. Mm -hmm. So according to the contractors that my clients are working with who are pretty, you know, pretty prolific, you know, guys around town doing a lot, things are moving. So I guess then it becomes a question of whether their client can continue to pay their bill. Mm -hmm. there's, there's that. But otherwise, everybody that can still work seems to be really grateful for that. And, um, and, and the permitting process seems to still be underway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, it's actually a good move for uh, construction companies to be essential businesses because the truth of the matter is, is that we're not going to have COVID-19 forever. And once we come out of it, there are going to be people ready to keep moving with business and, you know, wanting yeah. to get, and get their, their structures occupied. So uh, this will come to an end. So um, I think it's a good move to keep, keep going with construction. A funny, um, sort of a funny, but not funny anecdote. I was talking to some construction guys yesterday and they were talking about how restaurants are allowed to stay open for takeout and delivery. Thank goodness. You know, there's something. And those guys are allowed to keep working but their, their construction trucks don't fit through the drive throughs <laughs> So I was like, wow, that's a really good point. <laughs> that's a great point. So to anybody out there, because you know, I was talking to a plumber and he said, look at my truck, I can't fit that through, through takeout and we're really busy. So to anybody that does have a business that is catering to, you know, availing themselves of takeout and delivery options, put a big sign on the front of your store with your phone number Mm -hmm. so call you and tell you they're outside and they want something need something from you <laughs> yeah that would help i think it would probably drive some business to that place too so yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's funny um so um with regard to um residents there is protection as far as evictions are concerned yeah I find that there's that same protection for businesses well, right now, I do. As far as I know, the Texas Supreme Court has only issued the halt in evictions for residential situations. Mm -hmm. That could have changed this morning, for all we know. And my guess is, like everything else, because this is so fluid, that there could be something, there could be, you know, some sort of business protection act that comes along that does the same thing for a real estate for a commercial real estate mm -hmm. i would hope so i mean because if you're evicted out of your space you're basically out of business you know in, in some businesses everyone is not doing extremely bad and so there are some businesses um who might just be on brink on that brink that right. are not quite ready to close but um they may need some grace you know with regard to a payment you know, and, and not absolutely picked out. And and along those lines, it is our you know part of our effort and our first choice for all of our clients and every tenant everywhere is if you do get a landlord to agree to give you something, get it in writing, because if it otherwise means that you're in default of your lease, yes. then that can come back totally against you so anything that anybody agrees to which is not legally mandated by your contracts please get it in writing if you have the ability get your attorney to create an amendment for your lease that the landlord signs that says i'm agreeing to let you not pay rent for a few months and we'll we're you know do it later so that 
you have proof that you're not in violation of your contract. In general, everybody needs to really document everything. So back to the force majeure issues, if let's say the construction couldn't work right now and you couldn't finish building out your restaurant, that's a force majeure inclusion for the most part. Um, but you have to document everything. If you're getting an email from somebody saying, I can't get there to fix your plumbing right now, you, you need to keep that record and everything else it's even you know anything along those lines mm -hmm. yeah that's great advice documentation it always wins in court mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. always wins in court always yeah. so you know we've been talking about some pluses and some minuses you know about this um situation as far as real estate is concerned um are there any silver linings to this situation from a commercial real estate perspective mm -hmm. You know, I think like any other sector of the business world, there are people that are going to find opportunity here. You know, we work with a lot of franchises. There's going to be smaller franchises that are going to get absorbed by larger franchises because of their vulnerability right now. So a silver lining might be the, the opportunity for some folks which is not necessarily a good thing from the people on the other side of that equation, but maybe there'll be some consolidation in a way that, that has the strongest companies left um, that really know how to run things and manage things well, possibly. Um, hopefully landlords and tenants come out of this with greater appreciation of each other and, and everybody, you know, for that matter. And, um, uh, other silver linings. I, I just, I think that, I don't think that anybody knows the answer to any of those questions until we know how long this is going to go on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, because right now it seems that the silver lining is everyone treating each other better and, and being able to be in someone else's shoes. Yeah, well, and what we're seeing, especially for restaurants, is those folks, first of all, those folks that were already heavily um, oriented towards takeout and delivery are, are doing better than the others. Just like any essential business, Walmart is doing great. You know, they're hiring. HEB is hiring. Um, but it also is interesting to watch, and of course, my focus is, is usually largely on restaurants, to watch the loyalty coming out of the customer base to all those neighborhood businesses that have been there to serve their community so well for so long, you are really seeing, um, you're really seeing the payback for that. You're seeing $10,000 tips or you're just seeing, you know, there's a, there's a local Italian restaurant in a neighborhood I'm usually in that hasn't lost any business. There's a wing restaurant I represent that has been around forever and has done an amazing job and hasn't lost any business. So I think the silver lining too is showing that that kind of commitment to your customer and then community involvement and stuff, it really works. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and people are thanking you for it. Mm -hmm. And that's a good lesson for any other business. Every business. Uh, that's a great lesson. Make sure you uh, take care of home, take care of your community where where you are, because those people are going to be your walk up customers. They're going to be your people that want to stick with you because they want to see the neighborhood continue. So right, yeah. right, yeah. That. So, um, everyone, there is a silver lining. There's a silver lining with every issue. There's still a silver lining. Crisis and opportunity always exist. So we just want to encourage everyone to just stay positive because when your mind is positive, you can always think of a solution. It, it, you might not arrive at it right away, but you will arrive at one as long as you stay positive. So Emily Durham, we want to thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for all of your advice and uh, supporting the chamber and let everybody know how they can get in touch with you. Yeah, for sure. And thanks so much for, for having me. Um, we, our website is watermansteel.com. That's W-A-T-E-R-M-A-N-S-T-E-E-L-E. -E -E. 
Um, and our phone number is 713-575-3700. We're, you know, we're here to help. We're happy to help. We're happy to connect you with others that might be able to help you when we can. So reach out and we'd love more stuff to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> Could you repeat your phone number one more time, Emily? 713-575-3700. Three seven zero zero is our main line, um, and again, if you need or anybody needs us to send you some of these links we referred to about how you apply for different things, um, if anybody in this audience is part of the restaurant community, I am a board member of the Texas Restaurant Association and can send you all kinds of links about the amazing work they're doing for restaurants and help you can get. Thank you, thank you for that. We definitely have members that could um, use that help in the restaurant business. And so we are wrapping up our time with Emily at, during this chamber chat, and we really appreciate uh, Emily's support, Waterman Steel's support. Please visit their website. Uh, please give them a call if they can be of assistance to you regarding your uh, real estate needs. And pay attention to the Chamber website. We have so much information there for you to use all on our social media, Greater Houston Black Chamber of Commerce. Um, every Tuesday and Thursday, we have Chamber Chats to give you this information to help your business. So please uh, share this information, let other people know, and um, just continue to, to, to stay connected with us. We're gonna always try to bring you information that can help your business. So until next time, we will see you on the next Chamber Chat. Emily, have a great day and thank you. Thanks, Carol. You too. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.